This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is Chris Abraham, Season 5, Episode 37 of The Chris Abraham Show. This might be a two-parter, because I might not get all of my ideas out in the first one, or it just might be a short show. Um, This is The Chris Abraham Show, and today's episode is about the inevitable liberal and conservative pendulum that everybody believes that they are able to escape from, right? There is always a belief that the political system in America or around the world will, uh, in the past, has gone kind of in a pendulum between extreme left and extreme right, and that this is inevitable. Recently, though, um, there has been a lot of energy spent on trying to maintain a more leftist, more liberal, more enlightened, uh, sustained swing to the left. And the funny thing about it is as this belief is becoming more and more uh, fait accompli, and more and more assumed the pressure building up because of unintended consequences and because of blowback and because every action has an equal and opposite reaction, the more assertion, the more pressure, the more censorship, the more controlled messaging, the more um, aggressive support, the more uh, revolutionary fervor, the more extreme leftism, the more openness with using words that are generally historically more associated with the things that America has always balked at, such as Marxism, socialism, communism. These things are just putting more pressure on a ferocity, a ferocious um, buildup of pressure that will in fact become an equal and opposite pressure. The further that the, the further that the left pushes the uh, natural cycle of the pendulum, to the left, the more assertive that the right, which is a majority in America, they, they've always had names for it. They call it the moral majority, or they call, which of course makes you say, but I'm not immoral. But compared to traditional uh, 5,000 years of human existence, um, LGBTQIA+, is considered uh, a little unique. And while one might say that in quote-unquote tribal societies, there is always uh, some, you know, two-spirit, generally speaking, the two-spiritness in a tribe is a, is a rarity and is not normalized. It's a, it's a rare holy position rather than an entire tribe being um, I don't know, uh, some variation of non-binary or queer. Uh, so based on that, I'm always afraid. I'm very gay friendly. I hope everybody is able to let their true self show beautifully into the world. But my fear is always, and I was watching a, um, a trans woman in a show yesterday, and I'll try to link to it um, 
she's afraid that she's a pick me girl. She's afraid that she might be the kind of trans woman that people like me can understand. And her premise was that there is right now, what is happening now is a divorce that's happening between the LGB and the TQIA because the LGB is a sexuality or a sexual preference and the TQIA plus are gender identities and neither the twain shall meet. Uh, even the lesbian, gay, and bisexuals, in this case was mostly gay men, were saying that the, sec that the gender identities are not real, which I feel like are fighting words to people who believe that they were born uh, as non-binary or uh, as the opposite sex when they were born and that uh, gender is a construct. I believe that having gay men say that um, their reality isn't a real reality is probably, and I hate this word, problematic. So I will share the video, but it's very interesting because at the end of the video, she's like, I've spent the last 10 years, and this is kind of paraphrasing her, she said, I've been spending the last 10 years, 12 years, 10 years, trying to tell you to kind of chill out and not be so extreme that this is going to instigate or catalyze a reaction by the reactionary right. And that the pendulum is so far left now that there is going to be inevitable blowback, not just feedback, but blowback. And her belief is that this is going to result in a lot of um, homophobia, uh, not only transphobia, but homophobia. And that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when it went from don't ask, don't tell to um, a normalized gay marriage and normalized uh, gay services and normalized gay partnership and normalized gay taxes and normalized gay uh, work um, coverage and things like uh, life insurance and health insurance and all these kinds of umbrella services that straight couples and straight partnerships have historically had, cisgender, straight, etc. Um, her belief is that the, um, the community, and she says that's also a problematic phrase because uh, it's not a community. What it is, is it's an, it's an alliance of people who are trying to fight phobia. So it's, it's an alliance, not a community. Um, her belief is that this blowback is going to result in, um, in uh, legislations and violence and re, uh, reconsideration of decisions that were made a decade ago because from because there's going to be a reaction, a reaction, a reaction to um, things that seem more dangerous than normalized. For example, the groomer concept, right? You can't just say um, there are more groomers in the Catholic Church and the religious space or in the 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 scouts or whatever, you can't say there are more groomers, uh, which is to say pedophiles in the straight community than there are in the um, LGBTQIA community and make that be all right. Once, once the right starts perceiving as the LGBTQIA community as being threatening to them and not just integrated with them. Um, you know, it comes down to pick me, right? This is all about 
Um, you deserve the rights that I have, but not one right more. Now that the uh, LGBTQIA community is being treated like a protected class or a protected species, that makes the cisgender, white, straight communities feel like they are lesser than uh, upon the fact that there are videos of people saying, we will take your children and we will, uh, we will convert your children and we will uh, make your children non-binary, we will trans them, etc. It doesn't matter what the truth is, it only matters what people perceives, perceive. And if this becomes a panic, if this becomes an anti, nobody's going to admit to being anti-trans, but you can see every day that straight men are saying, I will, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in dating, quote unquote. I'm not interested in dating an ugly woman or a fat woman or a tall woman or a flat woman. What makes you think that I'm willing to date a trans woman? All of these kind of things. If you start making a silent majority or a moral majority start to feel like they are under threat and they are not, you know, you they are not generously in some sort of noblesse oblige, noblesse oblige kind of giving, um, sharing and accepting a community into theirs as opposed to a rigorous and vigorous separation and resentment and hatred and outward hatred for everything that is cis, everything that is straight, everything that is square, everything that is norm, quote, normal. Um, and when you start exposing a type of sexuality, a type of evangelism, a type of um, um, promotion, you know, when it goes from um, what happens in my bedroom is my business to do not prevent me from exploring my own sexuality, my own identity in public wherever I want, or bringing into the classroom or sexualizing children when they were the perception of sexualizing or genderizing children when they're under 18 and someone else's children, all these things are going to have rigorous, vigorous, and violent blowback. And this particular trans woman on the, the, uh, on the uh, YouTube, on YouTube, uh, did an amazing job of arguing that. She didn't argue anti anything that was anti-trans, anything that was anti-gay. Um, she was just saying that, um, and you know, this is a, this is a, you know, a, a traditional trope, which is to say, if you turn the heat up on the pan full of frogs too high, the frogs will jump from the pan. And it's really important when you do cultural revolutions, unless you rely on, on uh, literal violence in camps, and a real revolution where people are put into camps and they're put into gulags and if they are not flexible they are they are removed or killed or or you know brainwashed or whatever like if you want to do a hearts and minds conversion where over time people come become more and more normalized to what have been traditionally countercultural norms and values then you need the frogs to normalize to the change in heat in the pan without encouraging them to jump out. And by analogy, jumping out in essence means start to be violent against the LGBTQIA community, which will be hereby taken as a lump. So it will blow back not only on um, uh, transphobia, but because the entire thing is an alliance, you know, uh, the action of Japan will have, or BRICS, let's use BRICS, Brazil, 
you know, uh, uh, Russia, India, China, South Africa. The action of, of, of Russia will flow into the reputation of all the other places. If, if India gets into a war with Pakistan, then there will be consequences for Brazil, Russia, China, and South Africa. So when you are in a strict alliance, when you are an LGBTQIA+, um, it's um, uh, all or nothing, right? It, so if the um, blowback, you know, that's happening already with regards to uh, Roe v. Wade, right? That was, um, that could have been something that was pushed too far too fast. It seemed like, you know, America was perfectly fine uh, with the way things were set up. We're very uh, pro-personal choice, pro-independence. If it's in my body, it's me kind of culture. And, you know, the more pressure, the more, you know, people were, um, you know, the religious right was hearing things about full-term abortions, abortions after the baby was delivered, all kinds of crazy things that they associate with eugenics or with blood sacrifice or with sacrifice to Baal or with Luciferianism or with Satanism or with anti-life or with degeneracy. And here we have that word degeneracy. Now, when um, the normalization of les gay, lesbian, and bisexuals into their ability to have legally sanctioned by the state, by the, by the country, by companies, by HR, by the military, and so forth, the normalization of this means that the perception of a threat level is zero. The moment that there's a perceive perception that the entire that this was a complete um, it was a complete trap. It was a bait and switch. Uh, there was a uh, you were pretending to be normal people who just happened to love other people of your same sex because love is love into a an active mo movement of degeneracy, right? Like if the if the if the right starts perceiving the entire leftist culture as a giant uh, fuck fest, like you know, like like happens um, during Burning Burning Man or the Rainbow Festivals, or or if it if it's you know uh, fearlessly and shamelessly um, uh, chaps bare butts bare bodies in the Pride Parade. Uh, if it becomes something that people are conspiring to do against your children or trying to do against the children's will, or if there's anything on TikTok about, you know, I'm a teacher, I have an opportunity to um, disabuse these children of their, uh, patriarch their patriarchy or their capitalism or their traditionalism, disabuse them of their belief in God, disabuse them of their belief in um, one boy, one girl. Boys love girls, girls love boys. Boys get married to girls and have babies. To disabuse them of that, right? Like things like the libs of TikTok and what is a woman and um, associations with the LBG, LGBTQIA with pedophilia or grooming children. This is, and the fact that this has been pushed away for at least five years. I mean, honestly, once children were home and using Zoom to get their schooling, and once, uh, People started listening in on some uh, some school videos and realize uh, streaming uh, webcams and realizing that the that the uh, that the textbooks in their perception I'm an only child who has no wife has no kids has no connection to public education I'm just saying the the chatter that's coming to my ears is there was this perception that nobody knew what was going on until they could listen in on the webcams. And the fact that it seemed to me, in my perception of the chatter, that 
teachers were saying that parents were prohibited to listen in on what was going on in the schools. But of course, that just makes parents want to record everything even more. And the fact that people were responding negatively to how much people were freaking out when the libs of TikTok were sharing things that they didn't steal off of a hard drive, that they just found on their own, publicly posted in spaces like YouTube, TikTok, stories, etc. This is an inevitable, inevitable powder keg that's going to explode. And I do not want a world where there is active homophobia. I'm like, I mean active, like kinetic homophobia, kinetic uh, transphobia, kinetic anti-black racism, kinetic anti-foreigner racism. I do not want all of these anti-transphobia, anti-homophobia, anti-racist um, um, revolutions to end up getting the complete smackdown of a bully that's 10 times your size. Like, not 10 times, but 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Like, 5 times your size. Like, in many cases, the enemy, if you will, is 70 to 80 percent of the population. Really, um, uh, Jewish communities, black communities, gay communities, trans communities, non-binary communities, while the numbers are growing and you and the community is, enjo is enjoying a popularity where, you know, people are uh, it's become extremely trendy, right? Like uh, recently on Breaking Points, I heard that between 30 and 50% of all Ivy League school students identify as gay or trans, right? So there's a huge number of people in these elite universities, but also remember that um, not that many Americans go to college. And very, very few of them go to Ivy League universities. And I dare say, since um, the fact that, you know, the joke is, is that um, all college girls tried lesbianism during college, right? The joke is, is I was gay at Smith. I was gay at Yale. I was gay at Harvard. So... Try experimenting with sexuality and desire and lesbianism and bisexuality and so forth is a trope. It's a common trope. It's not invented. There's a tendency for, um, for, for experimentation in a safe environment to be something that people do, even if it's in their heart of hearts. Like, let's say that when you try out lesbianism, or try out bisexuality in college, or in, 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 in K through 12, that might always be a part of you, right? You might look back at that, you know, because you're so cool and so enlightened with great fondness and great openness. And, but you might decide that you want to have a family and that you want to have kids and that you are going to gulp suffer the fact that men are awful, disgusting, smelly, and selfish, and you are going to make a life with a husband to the best of your ability, right? So the way people act and the way they believe are oftentimes different, but it is completely common that people identify as being bisexual, lesbian, or gay during their time of exploration and experimentalism while they are at an Ivy League elite university, one of the seven brothers or the seven sisters. So that's not new. I'm just afraid about the blowback, right? There's a bully in the room who um, has, whether he admits it to himself or herself or not, has been um, grandiose has accepted you into their country, right? It might not be what you like, but you were allowed to be equal and not just a freak. So now there's this belief that 
um, there's this 20% of the population is saying, okay, thanks for allowing us to be normal like you. By the way, you're not normal. You're racist. You're sexist. You're capitalist. You are Christo fascist. Um, um, you are uh, killing. You you are killing children by not allowing them or wanting them to transition. You are killing women and girls by not allowing them to, or not wanting them to get uh, at will abortion and so forth. And all of these like this results in wait. Who the, uh, who the hell are you? I'm the person who is so, so grandiose as to allow you, as to stop bullying you. WTF are you doing trying to cancel me? I, in the 80s and 90s, decided to stop canceling you and allow you to go ahead and be who you are and experience your own love is love. And now you're telling me I don't have the ability to be who I am? Let me show you how big I am. Let me show you how big my church is. Let me show you how big my heteronormative world is. Let me show you how many white people there actually are in this country. And that what happens if we do not explore the noble obligation of being good to our neighbors. And if we give you a little bit of shit canning. Um... And that's what I'm afraid of. And that's what uh, the uh, YouTuber uh, trans woman is afraid of, too. And uh, she seems to believe that this blowback is happening now and that it is going to get pretty ugly and that she doesn't know what to do and that she's trying to, she said, what should happen is finding a way of taking LGBTQIA and doing an audit and auditing out all of the perceived grooming, uh, attention to children, attention to K through 12, and like any heteronormative normie, you you're not allowed to touch a girl who's under 18. And generally speaking, you shouldn't really um, touch a girl who's uh, less than 10 years your junior. So. There is, um, she says that the only way that this is going to be abated and to calm down is if there's a rigorous de quote, quote, de lousing of groomers and pedophiles from the LGBTQIA um, world. Uh, we see how the Catholic Church and their unwillingness to actively de louse the Catholic Church and disabuse them of all of their pedophiles. And you know what a pedophile does? A pedophile goes to where the children are, right? So if you are a pedophile, you will become a scoutmaster, or you will become a parish priest, or you will become a school teacher, or you will become, um, et cetera. Maybe you'll become a, um, a, what is it called, uh, the, the kind of uh, doctors that, uh, pediatrician, right? So, oy vey. so like, I don't know. And of course, this is going to blow back on, on, on um, anti-Semitism, and this is going to blow back on feminism, and this is going to blow back on uh, socialism, and this is going to blow back on Marxism, this is going to blow back on Antifa, and this is even going to blow back on any self-identified, trained Marxist associated uh, black activism as well. And it's going to be really ugly if it happens. And I don't know how to prevent it. And I'm seeing it happen too. So this is my prediction. And inshallah, I hope it doesn't happen because love is love. And uh, I grew up in Hawaii where we used to call people who were second to spirit or just gay or lesbian or whatever. Um, there were a lot of trans Hawaiians and they were called mahu, but mahu isn't like, you know, the F word or, you know, anything like that. Um, 
it's not like calling someone F-A-G or F-A-G-G-O-T. Like, mahu is merely a descriptive thing. Like, I've asked all my friends from Hawaii to make sure it's not just a, a howly freaking like, guy from New York. Even though I was there from 6 to 18, I wanted to make sure it was a loving word. And it is, like, um, uh, mahu, uh, sec- two-spirit or or uh, trans or whatever, um, they were um, on Palominos in major uh, parades and they were, they're adored and they're accepted and they're loved and they're part of society. And um, growing up and, you know, there's always been lots of gay bars in Waikiki and I'm sure elsewhere and lots of gay clubs and it's always been a culture that's been completely normalized in Hawaii. Uh, so I don't want anybody to be transphobic or, 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 or uh, homophobic or um, racist or sexist or any of that stuff. My dad, my mom trained, my dad was a little bit homophobic because he was a pretty boy and he didn't like male attention. Um, but that, <laughs> I recently realized how often my mom uh, must have thought I was gay growing up uh, because years later when I was an adult, she's like, it's not that I have anything against people being gay, but I was really happy when you weren't gay because I didn't want your life to be harder than it would be. So... I don't want anybody's mom to tell them that they feel like being gay, lesbian, trans, and so forth would result in a life of suffering. I want everybody's life to be as, as, I want everybody's baseline to be as gentle and loving as possible. Um, we're all chaotic people. Each one of us are our own biggest, our own biggest enemy. Um, but I don't want the external world to look at you cross-eyed. So lots of love. I hope that this all figures itself out without any violence. Um, and uh, I don't know what it's going to look like. Like, the yeah, this, this whole groomer thing uh, has been the whole, like, you're converting all of our babies to be uh, to snip off their genitals and all the other propaganda that's happening is actually really taking root and really finding a uh, grip and really finding traction. So uh, there's a belief and it goes all the way to oligarchs are all um, child traffickers and, and adrenochrome and people are drinking baby blood. And if you kill a baby when it's completely freaked out, you can extract this juice from it that keeps you alive forever. And then all the ball worship and the Satanism, like once the entire LGBTQIA community gets rolled up in being a bunch of demons that are all uh, need to be excised from the entire community, that's dangerous, right? So you don't become humans anymore. You become demons. And, uh, and people, you know, no matter how much you mock uh, people of faith, don't forget that there are, um, there are, um, uh, what is it? There are Orthodox uh, Jewish communities that still believe in, you know, and 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 demons and 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 sin. There are Christian communities that still actually believe in demons and the devil and the spiritual war between good and evil that are going to result in a in a uh, in a judgment day. There are Muslims who are the most believers in the entire world. I mean, they believe, believe, believe. And I was talking to a, a friend the other day, and he said that if he found out his son was gay, he would kill him. And I don't know whether that's real kill or like figurative kill. But if he found out that anything like this was happening, he said that he would move his entire family back to Albania. So, um... So, like, don't get that wrong. Like, don't forget, 
Um, um, uh, black families are pretty anti-gay and anti-trans. Um, a lot of them are Christian and anti-gay and anti-trans. Um, there's still a DL culture because a lot of black men and black women, as well as um, working class men and women, and certainly Latino and Latino and Chicano men and women who uh, need to stay in the closet because they're, 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 they're evangelical, they're Baptist, they're Catholic cultures, their families would, would, would completely not be okay with that. So, um, Muslim families aren't okay with that. Christian families, like, um, like it's terrifying. It's terrifying. And I really didn't believe it until I heard in 2023, you know, an Albanian friend literally talk like that. Like my parents, if I did come out as gay, um, and I'm sure that I was always coming out as weird for them because like I haven't dated anybody, you know, since uh, 2016, right? Like I don't even... Like, I'm just perfectly fine alone. Like, that's got to be its own weird sexuality. Um, they always knew I'm weird. Everybody knows I'm weird. Um, I'm on the edge of queer. I just don't have a non-traditional sexuality. I still like uh, Zoftig uh, uh, women who are well above teenagers. I don't even see what the appeal is in teenagers. Uh, they all look like daughters to me. They all look like nieces. Um, and I feel very protective of them. But, you know, women in their uh, 30s and 40s, man, all day long. Um, so, that's not it. But, uh, I'm happy, like, to be as homoerotic as possible. My homoeroticism isn't physical, though. I'm happy always to tell my friends that I love them and how beautiful they look and how gorgeous they look and all those other things. I'm not um, afraid of calling men beautiful or sexy even because I have eyeballs and I'm, not af I'm never afraid of anybody beating me up because honestly, every, all of my friends are more um, um, spectrum um, enlightened, younger beings anyway. So, and like I said, like nobody's cared whether you're gay or not in my urban world, my urbane world, um, you know, it, since the eighties, like my buddy Miles came out to me when he was 18. Um, he didn't come out in high school. We were, we were in high school till 1988. Um, so like that, he didn't feel comfortable with that. Um, but I wish he had, but in my, um, all boys Catholic school, we use the F word a lot, the F A G everybody called everything F A G. And that might've been, uh, because a lot of people called all boys, Catholic school boys to be F A G's as well. So I remember that when I was, um, a, high school wrestler in an all boys school. I know I got a lot of like stink from the other boys from other schools who would wrestle us. Um, you know, they would make jokes about, um, you know, um, don't feel me up. And this is not, this is not a makeout sesh and all that other kind of stuff. So maybe that unintended consequences, because, you know, even if you don't mean what you say, if, um, you use the F-A-G word as a weapon, uh, people who are gay, lesbian, bi, are going to feel it's a hostile environment and will keep their head down. And I understand this idea that it's really important not to keep your head down, but like, I don't know. I feel like I understand that, but you have to have risk assessment, you have to have risk mitigation. And um, while your environment, your cocoon, your community, your space, where you've moved to, to feel safe, your bars, your, your clubs, your, your 
requires uh, your schools, your state and local government, your cities feel like completely safe spaces. Realize that it's still, um, in many places in the United States, it's still the 19th century. In a lot of other places, it's still the 50s. In, in a lot of, lot of places, right outside the Beltway, it's still 1970s. So um, I don't want all the frogs to jump from the pan is all I'm saying. And I love you guys. I shared too much. Um, I'm probably mansplaining or my voice is a cisgender 53 year old white male isn't appreciated because I have entitlement. I have height entitlement. I have pretty privilege. I have blah, blah, blah. And I get it. So that's why only 12 people listen to every episode because my voice isn't important, isn't necessary and has a million imitators, uh, which is great because now I feel open to share because nobody's listening. So it's a perfect feedback loop. Again, I love you. I love you no matter who you are, who you love, what spirit you are, whether you believe or don't believe in a higher power, um, what gender you perceive yourself what gender you are, what gender you want to be, uh, whether you are identifying as whatever. I will always use your pronouns, and if I don't, it's a mistake. But I also feel like I need to opt in on that, and you can't make me. You can't make me do anything because I have my own agency, and I don't even with my own agency, I don't feel like I can tell you to do anything. So, ergo, you can't tell me to do anything. I need to opt in, and I need to do things out of compassion and love, and not because I'm made. Because that's where, that's where I jump out of the pan, is when there's strict enforcement. I'm extremely anti that. Anyway, I'll talk to you soon. I hope you guys are well. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.